Hey, y'all. I'm Brittany Packnett Cunningham. I'm an activist, a writer, host of the podcast, Undistracted. Technically, I am a woman on maternity leave. I have a very new baby, but... <laughs> a few months ago, when I was asked and invited to moderate this live signing with Premier Collectibles and the one, the only Viola Davis, you know I had to say yes. So I'm so excited to be in conversation with Emmy, Tony, Oscar winner, and author of Finding Me, the 2022 Oprah Book Club selection, y'all. Viola Davis, welcome. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me. I am absolutely thrilled to be in a conversation with you. And, you know, like I said, they asked me months ago and I kept saying, you know, where's the book? Somebody give me the book. I need to read the book. And I realized I was waiting because they had to print that little sticker on the front that says it's an Oprah book club selection. So here you are excavating the stories of your life. And Oprah says, I'm gonna go ahead and give it that golden stamp of approval. How does that make you feel? Awesome. <laughs> you know, when you put a book out into the world, I think the worst thing is if you're misunderstood, mm. if people just don't get it and don't get your story, if it just doesn't land somehow. And that was sort of the first insight into it landing. Mm. So it meant everything. And coming from her, yeah, meant meant a lot. Well, I certainly believe that I understood the book. I mean, I experienced conversations with myself while reading it about pain, about power, um, about truth, about authenticity, about blackness, about womanhood, about motherhood, um, about achievement, but most certainly uh, about um, having conversations with and evicting your own shame. And I'm, I know that doing that couldn't have been easy. You talk even in the very beginning in the book jacket, you say that our, our stories are not often given close examination. And here you are giving your stories close examination in full view of the public in an industry that would much rather you be packaged and well-branded in a perfectly uh, designed kind of way. So what made you decide that now is the time um, and this was the book to write. Well, it's because I felt that I was going through a weird existential crisis, mm. which is a crisis of meaning. Mm. I started writing it during the pandemic, during the whole George Floyd of it all, Ahmaud Arbery, Breonna Taylor, the Black Lives Matter, um, the the poop fest, which was the election, the COVID of it all. Mm -hmm. I felt it was a time of wokeness, of uh, an, an awakening. Mm -hmm. And um, and with that awakening was an awakening of myself. Um, it sort of was uh, like me having to redefine myself. Mm -hmm. You know, especially in a culture where all of a sudden we were having dialogues about race. Mm. Dialogues, all of a sudden you saw people for the first time, even neighbors, in a completely different way. And whenever truth and someone or something is exposed, you can't go back to what it was before. That's where I felt I was. Mm. I couldn't go back to where I was before, where I walked into the room and suppressed my voice and a huge part of my voice is being a dark skinned black woman in America or being a child of poverty, someone who wet the bed, someone who saw a lot of abuse, mm -hmm. sexual, physical, mm -hmm. um, and who was a victim of it. All of that that was a part of who I was, I, I didn't wanna sort of leave in a, clo a locked closet anymore. And the only way I could do that was by telling my story mm -hmm. and telling it boldly and telling it with perspective and faith and courage. So that's why I wrote it. There are so many raw and painful descriptions of personal trauma in the book. Also these beautiful passages of joy and triumph I know that you said you believe acting to be a healing wellspring was writing this book also a process of healing. I mean, especially when you are spilling so much tea, that can be intimidating. It can be scary because you're not just telling your own stories. So many other stories are interwoven through it. Yeah, it was healing. I could say it now that it was healing. Um, you know, I, 
I, I have said in many interviews too, is the trauma, the pain, the failure is equal to the joy and the mm -hmm. peace. It's, it's all a, a part of the journey of life mm -hmm. and being a human being. One is not a detour from the other. Yeah. Brene Brown says it best, you know, you either own your story or your story owns you. Mm. And I would say that in order for me to connect to the world, I have to connect with myself. Mm. I just do. And those parts of running from those boys, of forgiving my father, mm -hmm. the bedwetting, mm -hmm. the shame, there is a part of that that is connecting me to the world in such a big way and to people in a big way. So how could I leave it behind? Mm. How could I not? How could I not examine it and say that, you know what? I I don't think that you could trade in your life for another life. Mm. This is the only life you get. So what are you going to do with it? How can you transform it and sort of run it through a machine? Even the sort of crappy parts, mm -hmm. run it through the, a machine. And when it comes out, it comes out like an elixir, mm. a magic potion for people to, to, to be able to have the permission to speak their truth. Um, I, I did feel like it elevated me. Mm. And, and you know what? The biggest revelation for me is this, is that young Viola was afraid a lot. 56-year-old mm. Viola is afraid too. Mm. But guess what? I've always kept moving. I've always kept fighting because that's all courage is, is, is fear said with prayers. That's right. That's <laughs> you right. know? So, um... That in and of itself, even that small discovery, and there's a lot of different discoveries, has released my life and mm. released my blessings. Mm. You talk about moving through fear, right? Not um, not getting rid of fear, but moving through it. We've yeah. got a question from Austin in Fargo, North Dakota, here in the United States. And he asks that if you're facing a situation that you feel like withdrawing and avoiding, your anxiety is through the roof, what specifically do you do to keep moving forward? Um, Specifically, uh, breathe. <laughs> <laughs> like take a deep breath, because I always realize I'm holding my breath when, I, when I'm afraid. Um, my daughter told me something to do, mm. um, which is to think of three awesome women in my life and sort of just shout it out in prayer, all the things that I love about them. And within that, shout out my own name and talk about what I love about myself. Oh, wow. That has helped me. And then I just do it. Mm. Here's what I know. Joseph Campbell says it. You move through life. You're born into a world that you don't fit in. And you answer your call to adventure, whatever that adventure is. You may refuse the call, but eventually you take the task and you move forward. And you'll meet dragons and lions and you'll have mentors and allies. And you'll come face to face, not with God, but with yourself. And then you have to make a decision when you see that self that you don't want to see be and that self that you do want to be, you make a choice for radical transformation to follow the path of the person that you want to be. Mm. And you, you, you could lose your life in it all. That's the whole journey of the hero. But eventually you find that elixir and you piggyback to your ordinary world and you share your elixir with others. Mm. That's the journey of a hero. And I feel that all of my experience in the past 
have provided me with everything that I need to meet challenges. Hmm. I know what to do. I've been on the path of radical transformation. I know poverty. I know hunger. I know personal pain. I have seen abuse. I've survived sexual abuse. I know what it means to, 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 to rise to the top. Mm -hmm. I know what it means to work hard. So whenever I see a task, I do the prayer of elevating these women, including myself, of breathing. But then the one thing I know is the one, once again, if you're always afraid to jump, then just jump afraid. Yeah. And that's what I do with the knowledge that I absolutely, without question, know that I'm up for the task. Absolutely. If that makes any sense. It makes perfect sense. I'm, I'm imagining that one of the names you call out in those prayers sometimes is the name of your mother, Miss May Alice Davis, um, mm -hmm. who said, no, my name is not Mary, it's May, despite what you <laughs> <told>. <laughs> Um, And you've shared so much about her. You talk about building an adult relationship with her. You say one of the beauties of getting older is really getting to know your parents. You talk mm -hmm. about her as she ages, that she's 78 now and her memory is fading. You said, as I watch her now, I am desperately trying to hold on to every bit of time we have left together. I'm trying to take all of the secrets and barriers off the table. I'm wondering what experiencing her, interrogating her life, excavating her life, looking through it, um, through the, you know, the sands of time, what that has taught you about what perspective really that's given you about your own life and, and how to share that journey with other people. She was the first imprinter of me. Mm -hmm. I am my mother's daughter and knowing her stories, I can release my own stories. That's what it's meant to me. I could sort of um, understand the, the, the sort of mysteries of even what is Viola. And, and also in knowing someone, I guarantee you, whatever judgment you make about someone, when you know their stories, the judgment goes out the window. Mm -hmm. Then they come into full focus. My mom is a product of both a cultural, she's a, a she's a, a, a product of both co the cultural side effects of racism mm. and her own personal story. Mm. I know that now. I know that now because she shared her own stories mm. to me. Mm -hmm. And so all of a sudden, I can't demonize my mom. Mm -hmm. I can't blame her for anything. And actually, even with her sharing her stories, I see how heroic she is. Mm -hmm. Because it's like someone said, just like five months ago, someone said this to me about COVID and the pandemic of it all. All we have to do is survive this, Viola. Mm -hmm. That's how I feel about life. Mm -hmm. The only thing we have to do is survive it because it is a poop fest. <laughs> Things come and sidelines. You don't know. You, you don't even know what tomorrow brings. Mm -hmm. The only thing you have, you have to make a conscious choice of loving and understanding that love is hard, of really connecting with people and then moving on. <laughs> so in hearing my mom's story, I feel like I'm understanding myself more mm -hmm. and um, understanding her more. That makes sense. It makes perfect sense. I, you know, I, I found so many parallels between you all, obviously survivors, yet still how somehow so soft and, and generous. Um, you write about inheriting her eyes and her survival skills and her pain. Um, I'm also thinking about another woman who um, whose inheritance is just all over you. Um, the great, the late great Cicely Tyson. Yeah. Um, Arlene from Lana, Maryland, um, asked about when you knew you wanted to pursue a career in acting, which of course brings us to the first time you ever mm -hmm. see Cicely Tyson on screen playing Miss Jane Pittman. 
Um, I remember being shown that film and the older I've gotten, the more I've watched us become deeply cynical about representation, right? Because we've seen people bastardize it and use it to lower the bar and lower the standard of what's possible. We can forget how important it is to actually see yourself so yeah. to tell us about that time of, of seeing her and and experiencing this journey of a career that goes from you seeing her on screen to then sharing screen with her. What I saw with Miss Tyson can only be explained knowing where I was growing up in Central Falls, dark skin, growing up in abject poverty at 128 Washington Street. That for me, I just felt that it was like watching magic, mm -hmm. like watching a magician take a rabbit out of the hat. Mm -hmm. I saw excellence. I saw um, transformation from 18 to 110. But mostly, here's the thing that I saw with Miss Jane Pittman that I think is so valuable about what we do as artists. I saw her create a fully realized human being mm. that was Black. Mm -hmm. And that's what's always been missing with us, yeah. that people don't understand that we're human beings. Yeah with all the complexity of what it means to be a human being. We were three fifths of a human being. We were considered to be chattel. Growing up, I just believed I was just ugly. That's it, nothing mm -hmm. else. And in so many other circumstances and so many other storytellings, you're, review you're reduced to a device or a metaphor. Mm -hmm. But with Miss Jane Pittman, I saw this woman who looked like my mom create a human being. And I sat with that human being that she created for a full week. Mm. And when she left the screen, I felt like I was missing someone. Mm. And that's the power of art. The power of art is should have the same feeling you have when you go to church that power of being elevated from your life and seeing the possibilities of a life. Yeah. And of just to have a human experience. That's what I saw with Miss Tyson. And it's really important. It's like I said, listen, kids can't don't deal with the abstract. We <laughs> deal with everything very literally. Mm -hmm. As as children, we deal they deal with the literal. So you need to see a physical manifestation of your dream. Too many people come into black communities, they look at little black kids who are coming from poverty, coming from challenging backgrounds, and they're telling them to dream big, dream fierce. They're telling them to go to school, then come back, not be just great, work 10 times as hard, and then elevate yourself and elevate your own community. And my big thing is how the hell do you do that? Mm. Who gives you the tools? What tools do you even have out there sometimes to give your life meaning in an environment where there is none? Mm -hmm. That's what Miss Tyson did with Autobiography of Miss Jane Pittman. She answered all of that in mm -hmm. one performance. That's the power of excellence. Mm -hmm. um, we have a couple of questions in particular um, that, that key into something you just spoke about, about the image you had of yourself, of the narrative you had of yourself that you believed, as you said, you were just ugly, that you were just poor, that these were the limits um, that you saw in your life. Um, Eve and Eve's mom from Tampa, Florida want to know how you overcame the things you didn't love about yourself. How I overcame it. People talk about that too a lot or ask me that a lot. Um, you know what? I believe that any transformation is gradual. It's mm -hmm. not like Wonder Woman who just spins and then all of a sudden becomes Wonder Woman or the Hulk who just gets angry and then all of a sudden he's reborn, right? 
I think transformation within yourself is a gradual process of unpacking and examining baggage and understanding you did the best you could with what you had. Um, retelling your story and understanding how brave and bold and courageous you were. Mm -hmm. And you know what? I understand. I understand that a lot of people say you got to pull it from yourself. I disagree. Mm -hmm. I think we need each other. Mm -hmm. I listen sometimes with certain people out there, you wish you didn't, <laughs> <laughs> but we need each other. Yeah. It meant something to me to have a teacher look in my eyes and say, I think you're beautiful. Mm. It carried me. It helped me. It meant something to me when someone said, I'm, I, I don't want you saying that you can't do something anymore. Okay, Viola, you can. You've run out of excuses. It meant something to me when someone just sat with me while I cried my eyes out about mm. something. And gradually what happens through all of that is you believe that you matter, that your life matters, that you mattered. And not everyone has that. So I had teachers, strangers, relatives, myself, who gave me just enough of something that when it was all melded together was like a big explosion of love, of joy, of grace. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what's brought me to where I'm, I'm at today. And, you know, a lot of people will say, Viola, you know, you are beautiful. You know, and, you know, that outfit you had on yesterday, girl, <laughs> you worked it. And that <laughs> lipstick, it's not about the lipstick and the outfits. Yeah. It's not about stunning on the red carpet. Beauty is something and believing it is way deeper than that. Mm -hmm. It's believing that you were born and you have a gift that you can inject in the world that is different than what anybody else has. Mm -hmm. And whatever that is, is magnificent. That's beauty. Yeah, That's true beauty because you can use it. Because you can use it. I, I want to keep going with that for a second because, you know, you're in an industry where it can be easy to mask the feelings of self-doubt and worthlessness with the applause, right? You talk about yes. this moment that your, your big sister, Diane, who, you know, was one of your most important teachers, basically gets you to ask this, yourself this question of, who and what you want to be. Mm -hmm. And you say that as a result, you came as a result of that question and this skit that you and your siblings put on, that, that you came to see achievement, that moment of applause, that, that elevated feeling when the accolades come as a way to quote, detox all the bad shit, the poverty, the racism, the shame, the colorism. Um, and so many times people will rely on the applause to detox all of that stuff instead of doing that work that you're talking about, tapping in. How have you evolved to a place where you recognize it's more internal work than it is that spotlight? It's been a process. I grew up. I grew up and understood, you know, at first, listen, I say this, I've been saying it all day, ad nauseum, is this. I always thought of my life like a relay race. And the relay race is, what do you do with your dash of time? It's like a relay race of the greatest runners. So you take your baton and you run your leg of the race and you pass it on to the next great runner, which is a next generation. And they pass it on to the next and the next and the next. And that's what life is about. And then I wrote the book and I realized that you're the only runner in the race. Hmm. That it's that six-year-old Viola who is in the back of this book, who ran her leg of the race. And it may have been messy. She may have had soiled underwear and smelled. She may have been very, very inappropriate, but she ran the hell out of her race and she passed a baton onto the 14 year old Viola 
whose only job was to just see a way out, out, a portal. She wanted to be an actor. And the 14 year old handed it to the 28 year old who woke up and realized that if I wanted to have healthy relationships in my life and I wanted someone in my life who loved me in a good nurturing relationship to break those generational curses, then I have to work on me. So 28 year old me went to therapy, then pass a baton on to 34 year old me who got married to 45 year old me who became a mom. And that comes with its own thing. Yeah. And now I'm 56 year old Viola. And I have the baton. And now what? It's a constant excavating. Mm -hmm. It's a constant figuring it out with each challenges, each year and each part of your life brings. And you're not done until you roll into the grave. I wish it were more definitive than that. But what I realize is that meaning and purpose are two different things. Indeed. And meaning is way more personal than mm. purpose. Meaning is me wanting people to feel less alone. Mm. That's my meaning. I want to matter to myself and I want to matter to other people. I do. In a life that is constantly telling, there is a powerful caste system out there where people feel like if you're on top, you're dancing with the gods. And if you're on the bottom by God and that person on the top falls, then it crushes you with them. I don't believe that. Mm. I think that's man-made. Purpose is me being a leader and leading Juvie Productions, which is my production company with my husband. That's purpose. That's different. But to answer the question is, it's a constant journey in my life. Yeah. And now I have the baton and I'm holding it tight, but I'm still running this leg of this race. Central to that journey Certainly for anybody, but I would also especially say for Black girls in a world not built for us, um, is our relationship to and with love and its relationship to and with us. You speak really candidly um, about the abuse your family suffered at the hands of your father, um, who you call the first man who you loved and the first man, uh, the first man who loved you rather, and the first man who you all loved. Fast forward, you meet and you marry Julius, the man you very literally prayed for. <laughs> um, <laughs> you build a family with her and your clearly very brilliant, beautiful daughter, Genesis. Um, and you, ex you also experience a shift in your relationship with your father um, as yeah. he evolves and grows as a person. You say in the book that Julius told you to learn to love and be instead of run and fight. I'm curious about what your family the one you were born into and the one you've built have taught you about love along that journey? First of all, that you can break generational curses. Hmm. You have the power within you to do that. What my family's taught me is that I'm worthy of love. I'm worthy of love. I'm worthy of forgiveness. And I'm worthy of all that, even being imperfect. Hmm. Um, and knowing that has given me what a lot of us black girls don't have. I don't feel like we're protected a lot mm. or adored. Mm -hmm. And that's what their love gives me a protection mm. and an adoration. And with that, you feel like you can do anything you do. You feel like, um, it's like someone said to me, what's home to you, Viola? You know, I want you to find home. And they're my home. Mm -hmm. I mean, not just the physical home, but the metaphoric home, my faith, my place of peace, um, and my 
place of grace. Mm. Um, yeah, that's what they are. I so appreciate you saying that, especially just looking at my the own, my own group chats and my phone right now. The lack of protection that Black women and girls are feeling is ever present, um, yeah. and may we all find that home. I want to transition a little bit to your incredible acting career. A few people, Marco from um, Bamberg, Germany, Eldon from Ontario, Canada. Lots of people have asked questions about your technique, about your approach. It brought me actually though to a very personal experience. So it's 2010. I'm a young woman who thought I was going to pursue acting. I grew up doing theater, musical theater in particular, um, but God had other plans. Um, but I always had a hunger and a thirst for it. So it's 2010. I scraped together all my little second job out of college money. I get in the car from DC to New York and I go and I see you and Denzel Washington star in the revival of August Wilson's Fences. Now I've oh. read August Wilson's script. I've, I've seen as many of the productions as I, as I could back home in St. Louis. Um, and this is my opportunity to finally see some of the greats do it. I went with my ex-boyfriend who was black and his best friend who was white. We had like, you know, we had like the tickets, we, uh, the front row of the balcony balcony, like that second balcony. Oh yeah. And, <laughs> my, so our, he, my, my boyfriend's best friend, he's like looking around really angrily halfway through the production. And I'm like, what is wrong with you? And he's so upset at how this majority black audience is very verbally, <laughs> very <laughs> excitedly <laughs> engaging with the two of you and all of the actors on stage, right? It's a whole, yeah, girl, you better tell them before I tell, like all of that, right? All of the yeah. animation that we bring wherever we go. And on the one hand, I'm like, you just have to understand this is how we consume our art. This is how we show up. Yeah. On the other hand, I know growing up having watched a lot of live theater that we often were not in the audience. And when we yeah. were, we didn't feel the space or the freedom to engage in a live theater like we might a movie theater, right? Yeah. And I watched your performance and it was such a masterclass, not just because of your technique, but because clearly when you've done this work of excavating your story and owning it fully, you get to the place where you can play with such honesty and authenticity that gives other people access to be ourselves when we come see you. Yeah. So A, I wanna thank you for that. But B, I wonder what it means to you to be able to convey that, especially at this point in your career. Cause I know all along you weren't always given the material you said to convey everything that was in you. So what does it mean to be able to open up spaces because you chose to pursue both the purpose and the meaning in your artistry? Um, I believe people come to the theater to have a human experience. Hmm. There's gotta be a human event when you are witnessing a human event, because I do believe that people will wait a lifetime for an honest moment on the stage. They will. You can even be silent. But when you do witness it, it tattoos itself in your spirit, in your mind, and you never forget it. Hmm. You don't. And who knows? what it can plant inside of you. And that's the power, that's the alchemy, which is art. Mm. And that's what I, why I wanted to be an artist. That I could use everything that was inside of me and channel it into a character and put it out there in the world and it could mean something to somebody. That for me felt the closest to magic and the closest to um, divine experience that you could possibly get. Yeah. And it's been the joy of my life when I'm able to do it. 
And it's been the bane um, of my existence when I could not do it hmm. in a character. But I feel like that's what makes our work as artists important. It is. Listen, whenever you saw a student in school who was having problems, you know, communicating or whatever, they always sent them to theater. Mm -hmm. Or if they were a troublemaker, they always sent them to the theater. And in the theater, you could find the jock. You could find the geek princess. You could find the cheerleader. You could find the artist. And they're all in one community. It is a sacred place mm. where you feel like you can like just sort of split open your heart, pour everything that's out there, the poop, the pee, the humor, the, the trauma and everything. And in that space, is a space of connection and healing where they can mix it all together and inject it into whatever is going on in that play and that performance and give it to the audience and you could be transformed and healed by it. Mm -hmm. I mean, come on. Mm -hmm. I feel like that's honorable. Mm -hmm. That's why I wanted to be an actor. And I have to say that it's played a huge role in sustaining me as a human being. Um, if that answers your question, art has the ability to heal. And I wanted to be a healer. Yeah. I wanted to be a healer of myself and I want to be a healer of other people. Um, so it's meant everything to me. Yeah. We only have time for one last question. Um, so many of the audience questions have been about how many folks really look to you for inspiration. But what also comes to mind is the word permission. How many people throughout your life as you wrote this book um, really gave you permission? People like Mrs. Cicely Tyson, people like your sisters, people like your mother who gave you permission to go out um, and be and do all of the things that felt like they were um, out of range and out of reach. I've been asking lately every wise woman I've been able to have audience with the same question. And it is, what permission do you hope your life grants others? What do you hope other people see as possible for them because they see you? Anything. Hmm. Everything is possible. It's possible. You know, I, I have to say that from the moment I was born, one of the <clears throat> things that were, that was very frustrating about growing up was everybody was always telling me what I could not do. Mm. Everything, everything that people told me was things that just weren't possible. And they started and ended with my blackness. You can't be beautiful. You can't be a lead. You can't, you know, you can't, you, you can't be great. Um, you can't be seen as, you know, really feminine, Viola. You know, you can't. Until I realize there is something that I have. I have my ruby slippers. You know, Dorothy, we went through that whole movie and she realized that she had the power to go home mm -hmm. right on her feet. She had the power to totally get the biggest dream she had in her life. She had the power with herself. There was no wizard. There was no man. There was just, yeah, there was a man behind the curtain. But there was no wizard. I feel the same way about people, about myself. My power, my ruby slippers is me. The voice inside of me, that voice that everybody tells you to ignore. They tell you to read books. They tell you to go online. They tell you to follow motivational speakers. Like even, I mean, really even me. We pale in comparison to that inner voice I, that I believe, me believe, that God planted in you. It is the purest voice 
and it tells you everything. And when you listen to it and you honor it, it will take you where you need to go. And here's the thing. You probably will go afraid. You will go anxiety filled. You will face failure. You will face judgment. You will face all of those things, but it's okay. Because here's the thing. It's the Anne Lamont quote. Is I don't know the meaning of grace. Only that it meets you where you are and doesn't leave you where it found you. Mm. You have to believe that grace will be with you, but you have to listen to the voice. Yeah. You don't want to go to your grave with that, that statement that haunts me, which is, I wasn't brave enough. Hmm. And if there is an elixir of the journey of a hero, which is going through fire and brimstone in order to transform and become your ideal self, and then finally facing death and slaying dragons and coming face to face with you, and then finding that elixir and pigging back to that ordinary world with that elixir, what you found, what you discovered, your sort of sword, The elixir is just that, mm -hmm. that the answer is in you. Your warrior fuel sword is you. Viola Davis, you are incredible. You are brilliant. You are all the way real. We thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, for being obedient to that still small voice. Um, I'm very sure that because you were and you decided to find yourself and tell us all about it, that other people will do the same. Thank you so oh, much. I'm Brittany Black and Cunningham. I'm grateful to you for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Hey, this is John Acuff, New York Times best-selling author of seven books and someone who's done a live signing. If you like the one you just watched, make sure you check out our YouTube channel. It's full of amazing authors having great conversations and signing books for viewers just like you. So make sure you subscribe and thanks for watching today.